And I think, in many ways, that transitions us to the second half of this discussion. You're welcome. Which is moving from the idea of the award itself to what is almost equally as um, controversial an issue. Um, that is how the Candler community has reacted to this issue. Um, and so I, I want to know y'all's thoughts on, you know, how, ha how have you seen the community reacting to this mm -hmm. and what are your thoughts and feelings? Um, I know this is particularly generative for you, Brian. Um, so this is, this is your space to, to share some of those thoughts. Sure. Um, so, like I said earlier, let's accept my disclaimer as the footnote that goes with everything I say. And if I do stick my foot in my mouth, uh, it would be kind of anyone who does go to Candler to um, find me tomorrow and, and kindly pull it out. Um, uh, but I ask that you be gentle, as you might be with a foolish child rather than a uh, kind of criminal. Um, okay, so... <coughs> I can really only speak personally. Oh, the glasses are coming <laughs> off. Right. Thoughtful professor Things are mode. getting serious. Um, I can only speak from my perspective, which is limited. But, you know, I, have, I think there's a lot of rightful uh, and understandable anger uh, surrounding the issue. Um, but this anger is not victimless, so to speak. So I've, I have had students approach me to say that they have been um, berated uh, mm. for either for their views or simply for not taking mm -hmm. some kind of firm stance. Mm -hmm. um, which, once again, you know, these, these kind of fiery emotions are understandable, but I think the issue that has to be taken into account is that um, we have been uh, blessed or cursed with living in an unfortunate time where, un for a number of people, these questions are still up in the air. Mm -hmm. um, in the academic community, um, where we espouse a particular kind of um, biblical criticism and uh, mode of doing theology, uh, it certainly seems uh, that issues surrounding human sexuality are actually settled. Um, but I think if we take a more honest look at uh, the Catholic Church, at the Methodist Church, um, at a number of our non-mainline uh, Christian brothers and sisters, we'll find that the uncertainty hasn't really been settled. You know, uh, So even though it may be 2013 and we can look back on the Civil Rights Movement and say, as if we have some degree of certainty, I think we have to realize that we actually live in a time where these, for a number of people, remain legitimate questions. Mm -hmm. um, and what that means is that we have to be careful in how we respond, um, unless it is the case uh, that there is no such thing as sort of vincible ignorance. That is, you know, any ignorant is, ignorance is not only um, sort of uh, academically culpable, but is in fact ethically culpable. Um, and it's it's possible that I too right now I'm guilty of uh, um, painting with broad strokes. So as I as I make this statement, this is a second reminder. Anyone who runs into me, please <laughs> uh, remove my foot from my mouth, and perhaps y'all will do that here. But um, the question that comes to mind for me, at least as a you know a, a straight Christian looking in from the outside, who's certainly sympathetic uh, with the LGBT community and have used for better or for worse, my commissioning paperwork is a nice little spot to protest against the Methodist Church, the Church's current stance on the issue. Um, I think what we have to recognize is this is not, the, the answer is not obvious to everyone. Um, and that means, for me at least, that I've had to start to consider the question, I'd be interested in hearing all of, yours, all of y'all's thoughts, is whether or not a distinction may be drawn between someone who advocates uh, celibacy in homosexuality, which is that, which is or what what or the someone who's, what, which is what Eddie Fox's official stance is. Right now, regardless whether, of what, what regardless, we don't know what we can never know what's happening in his mind. But in terms of his official statements, mm -hmm. um, that's what he's right. Supporting. And and I'm once again, I'm I'm less interested in defending. I'm not interested in defending sure. Eddie Fox. <laughs> yes. Let's be clear. Yeah. Sure. Nor am I really interested in defending the extension of this award. I think it's a reality that we have to deal yeah. with. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yes, and I think the impact of that reality is whether we take this as a chance, take this light to actually kind of um, evaluate, to, to hit the pause button and really think about how we're doing things. Because the rhetoric we've used, even within the Candler community, at least for a small mm -hmm. contingent of students, has been destructive. Yes, very um, much so. so. So the question I want to ask, and, and I think this is very important as we move towards reconciliation or uh, something less uh, ideal, is can we distinguish between someone who advocates celibacy and homosexuality, the Catholic Church, the Methodist Church's um, current stance, uh, 
at, at least as officially stated, and um, someone who is in fact homophobic. I'm less interested in determining which one Eddie Fox is. Right. I think it's for us right now. It's more important as a Candler community moving forward. I think I think it's one thing for us to make that determination, <laughs> and I think it's another <laughs> thing for someone who's whose life is being discussed. Mm-hmm. I, so I think for me, in a very kind of intellectual way, I can sit here and go, yeah, I, I think I can, I can separate that. There is a, a, a theological tradition dating back a very, very long time where people have put a lot of very real thought into the scriptures and they've, and they've reached this conclusion. And I can read the scriptures and, and I, can, I can see what they're talking about. I don't agree with it, but I, I can see how you get there in a faithful way. I have actually even heard Eddie Fox's arguments uh, from Scripture on this issue, and it's not, it's not without reason. So as an intellectual, yeah, I can say that. But it, that is very easy for me to say because it is not my life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And people have been deeply wounded by the church, and there's something really, really awful about being deeply wounded by the people who teach you to love God. Right. That there's a level of betrayal there that these are the people who, particularly if, you know, for gay people who grow up in the church, like this is where they learn to love their community and they learn to love God and to be pushed aside by that. And like, I think people learn about themselves through learning about God. Um, and so to that, that level of hurt and deep betrayal by these are the people who are supposed to be all about love having these conversations and and even if they are reasoned in some way i don't i don't think that hits at the real issue which is this deep deep hurt Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. and i think also and like my disclaimer is i am a heterosexual female and so again foot and mouth argument applies but um i'm so curious at why human sexuality is such a sticking point for Christianity. You know, like, how has... What is it about sexuality that has become the central doctrine in a lot of ways of our con- of our theological conversations? Um, not that I don't think it's important, because I think it's incredibly important. I just... I, I think... And, and it was quoted on Huffington Post, and I may be misquoting it, um, but the idea that if we somehow betray these seven Bible verses that talk about this issue, that talk about it, I mean, really, do they really? That's a whole other discussion. But that somehow we are we are betraying the whole of Scripture and the whole of Christianity. Um, and I think that that's a really interesting question to think about, too, um, is what are we so afraid of in having these conversations? What are we so afraid of? Well, I think, I think the thing is, is, um, is the conversation is there and people can have it. It's just neither side wants to. One side wants to say you're a bunch of homophobes and the other side wants to say you're a bunch of scripture haters. Or at least a bunch of, bunch of or a bunch of unrepentant Or a bunch of unrepentant Or at least the conversation is, has taken on a sort of rhetoric, rhetorical caricature. Yes, yes. In that sense. Yes. The rhetorical While we're caricature. painting with our really big paintbrushes. But here, and... Brian, and that's the, that's, uh, to, that's the... That's been the response that I've seen from, again, outside. I don't go to Candler. I have friends who go to Candler. Um, one of my best friends goes to Candler. And that's a joke. Anyway... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, but what I see is, is, you know, one side that just says, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, and there's no way that this can ever be right, and there's no redeeming value from this. Um, and I think that is just fighting a negative with a negative. Well, it, it becomes one of those incompatible <sighs> issues. If if I may, dive. Yeah. Although you have such a pain look, I on do. Your face, <laughs> why why don't you go sweetie. for it? <laughs> what I I just I, and I've been thinking about this a lot lately, and I think I may have even mentioned it here. I get that. I get that. Co- conversation is a great thing, but I also think that 
Jesus spoke differently to people who were truly marginalized than Jesus spoke to Pharisees. And this issue keeps coming up over and over and over and over again. Um, and what does it mean to have this convert? I mean, are, like when this conversation happens, it's not really between equals. There's people with lots of institutional power behind them and people who are vulnerable. And so I understand all of this. I do. But then there's a part of me that says, wait, so the people who are saying really damaging, hateful things get as much of a say as people who are being hurt. And and there's there's part of me that really bristles at that. But at the same time, can we marginalize should we marginalize the marginalizers? I'm I'm not sure that and I I don't think that people losing the power and privilege they've had is the same as marginalization. Well, no. Um but I think there's a difference between saying that that the other that those who have been marginalized should be brought up to an equal say and saying that we can't have this discussion because there has been a history of privilege. To me, saying that we can't have the discussion because of the history of privilege begins to begins to turn us into the marginalizers. I think you name that history of privilege, and I sure. think that that would, that's not that's so. What's happened is in these conversations that I've seen, it's been the Bible says so, and you're a sinner. Essentially, that's me. You know, being goofy about it, but still. <laughs> there has not been this recognition of privilege, and there hasn't been any repentance on the no. part of people who have been hurtful no, of there saying, hasn't. and I think that maybe that's another key part of this is this understanding that language is powerful, and the words that we say to talk about other people carry weight and are powerful. And so that's what I haven't seen at all. Um, but I, well, I guess the point I'm bringing up is let's let what can we do yeah. versus what can what rather than expecting them to do something let's say the other people on, mm -hmm. on the other side of this is you don't do anything should we still then allow for discussion brian um okay so and now i pause and, and fun, finally find myself let me make one more uh, comment before i'm taken off to the stocks and, and pillory <laughs> perhaps properly so um <clears throat> as i was saying earlier uh Right now, whether we like it or not, um, I, I don't think it's entirely unreasonable to concede that we live in a certain time of uncertainty. Yes. Um, maybe not in Candler. It certainly doesn't feel that way in the Academy. But a number of people carry traditions and power structures into into the school with them, um, especially primarily Methodists, you know, um, make up a pretty large contingent of our student body. Um, and so... No, I think that we have to honor that uncertainty. And the way that that happens means we have to be very, very careful with our language. And so what frightens me is I think the rhetoric has gotten to a point uh, where, as some other students have said, we sort of just talk past each other. Yeah. Um, and it's our rhetoric has also been constructed in such a way that the conversation has a clear winner and a clear loser, yep. um, regardless of which side you're on. Um, so uh, from my perspective, I would say that uh, if I were to kind of exist in this uh, funny conflict, I'd say, well, you know, my side that is for the ordination of gay clergy and for uh, marriage of LGBT persons, we should win, and all these other people are wrong. In fact, they're moral wrongdoers. Mm -hmm. They're ethically culpable for what they're doing. Um, <clears throat> the problem is, and what makes it very difficult practically to move forward uh, from there, is that it means that um, in order for progress to occur, someone has to be a loser. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe that's the case. I mean, now that I've said that, you know, maybe, it's maybe just, yeah. change comes with pain and that's necessary. But um, it seems that as responsible persons, we need to, those of us pushing for progress, for reconciliation, in fact, need to minimize the change. And so this is what, where I've come to sit, perhaps wrongly, um, but for better or worse, for this evening where I've come to sit on the matter is that... Um, we, what it means to be a loving Christian in dialogue with another person is to continue to be capable of seeing at least the possibility for good in another person. Mm -hmm. um, this is central in, in mm -hmm. 
Christian theology, at least as I understand it. You know, in our, in our corny John 3.16 that we throw at everyone. I mean, there's really some truth in that. You know, God loves a horrendous world. We all know this. Yeah. God loves this world that extends awards to allegedly people. Um, loves a world guilty of genocide, mm-hmm. um, guilty of atrocities, terrible things. Loves a world that crucifies God. But, in spite of it all, the incarnation takes place. Um, and so what I see in the incarnation is a striking uh, divine willingness to see at least the possibility for good in a horrific world. Um, and then that gets communicated to us. Shortly before Jesus is taken away to the cross, he gives a final command to his people to love others as, as he has first loved them. <clears throat> what that means is, as I understand it, to be Christian is to constantly engage in perhaps the cockeyed, optimistic task of always believing in the possibility for good mm-hmm. in another person. And what that means is that we have to be very careful with the way we use the term homophobic. Um, because a phobia, if we're going to be honest, uh, refers to a fault in the person. Um, it's a defect. And mm-hmm. it's not a defect brought on by action. It's something inherent in that person's quality. We all believe this. Um, psychologists believe this. Yeah. Phobias are listed in the DSM-4 and now 5, five yeah. as, um, as, as faults in a character. It's a character fault. Um, but, to to be clear, s- but to be clear, homophobia is not actually a phobia it's a it's a well word, that's and that's it's where a it gets word, it's a word right. we miss you that's where it gets uglier is it's become and, and sometimes it's it, we use it aptly you mm-hmm. know sure. sometimes but, it's aptly used but the danger is we don't just use it to say this is a phobia a fault that you need to overcome it's an ethically culpable and an ethically damning fault so we say this person is homophobia it's a fault in their character and they're punishable for it um and so what i fear maybe this isn't the case but my fear is that if we rule um if, if I'm not completely off in understanding homophobia this way, um, then it kind of puts a period at the end of a person's life sentence. And you've, you get to pass a final judgment. Yep. And what that also means is that if a person's in the breadth, the multiplicity, the complexity of an entire life can be collapsed into the single damning character, there is no possibility for reconciliation because there's nothing else to be reconciled in that person. And that's where I really fear, maybe this term sh- can be used accurately. Maybe it really can. But I'm reluctant... Um, to use it very often, and my fear is that it does get used indiscriminately. So my Catholic father might be labeled homophobic. And in that case, you know, or, or to hit close to home, the Methodist Church, which has a large contingent, About if only overseas, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, um, sure. that no, supports, it's, and, and some 20, at home. It's, yeah, the, vote, the vote fell out 60-40, which means the um, 20% of that is, the, of the 60 is the African delegations, and then the other 40% of that is a minority of the U.S. delegation. Right. So yeah. these persons, if they are all really just homophobic, if we can't distinguish between someone who advocates celibacy and homosexuality and homophobia, then the, then the, the Methodist Church should celebrate schism, just like someone would celebrate vomiting up a poison that yeah. ends, up, uh, ends up being a life-giving act. Um, and what makes me... Maybe that's the case. You know, Maybe that's what we rule. We should celebrate this. It's a purging of poison. Um, right now I'm living at least in a space of uncertainty uh, and I'm reluctant to celebrate uh, that vomiting of poison because I fear that it renders us incapable of reconciliation. I think that there's another piece of this and we had, you weren't here for this Brian, but you know us all really well, that we did not start, none of us started off where we are. Um, And I, I realize that in saying this I'm going to sound like there's some sort of progression to the way that we see things, which I don't think is necessarily true but like I have to tell you it feels way better on this side um where I don't feel any more like it is my responsibility to stand in judgment of other people or and I'm not afraid of God like I was I think that I think that there is some in this stance there's a fair amount of fear of God's wrath um and on the other side, that feels really different. And I, I have to wonder if in some of this, at least in my case, I watch, I watch all of this stuff play out, and I, and I think, like, it doesn't have to feel like that. It doesn't have to be like that. Um, if your theological stance is taking on seven Bible verses at the expense of the whole, there's some real fear behind that. I wonder, though, if we're, if we're producing a paper tiger. 
is it really as simple as seven seven Bible verses? I mean, the Catholic argument, for instance, can it be condensed all the way down to, well, the Bible says so? Um, I mean, the argument that specifically, Eddie, again... I, I will I, say, sure, the Methodist argument... That's what I'm saying, that. yeah, that's yeah, what I'm saying. I'm saying argument. the Methodist argument, yeah, that, and coming from that context. And I think also the other piece of this is looking at what does it feel like who's a woman who's called to ministry and like how the text has been used in that way um, and how much richer the life of the church is and how much richer our lives of faith are when there are more people at the table. So mm -hmm. I think that there's, I think some of this frustration is not just so-and-so is a homophobic jerk face. It's also... Could be. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's also this can be better than it is. Well, and there's that, that yearning for that. Well, um, the question is how, we, how do we responsibly as Christian leaders, because everyone walking around Candler claims to be a responsible Christian leader, mm -hmm. self-identifies self that way. <laughs> well, at least that's, that's a, a view. Yeah, that's also um, the, the um, <laughs> how do we mission statement of Candler is to train leaders. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. How leaders. do we as responsible Christian leaders get to that better place? Because I'm not yeah. saying that people shouldn't be upset. I'm not saying that people shouldn't yearn for something better. It all makes sense. And let me also point back at the, to my disclaimer. <laughs> I'm a straight Foot, white, mouth, ma straight white <laughs> male, a blue-eyed, blonde-haired Prussian. Like I'm, I am the oppressor. Yeah, as, as, as Stop history. oppressing me, Brian. It's true. You, know, um, you too. But but I think we have to be be careful never to assume that uh, that we've assumed the we have actually reached the margin. Or ever whenever yeah. we take up a perspective, we create new margins. Yeah. Um, and the Bible stops talking to us. Or the Bible, if we if we assume that we're on the margin and someone else is the Pharisee, then the Bible has stopped speaking to us in a challenging way. Oh, I'm not sure that. I, and and the way like the way that I'm using that argument is not other people are the Pharisee and I'm marginalized. I think that there is some. I mean, I think I could very much say that I'm a Pharisee if you look at power and privilege and all that kind of stuff. Um, but does that does that always communicate in our rhetoric? Right. Can you get it vocally? <laughs> no, I, th I think <laughs> I think you raise a good point. I, I think to me, where I come out is there needs to always be room for discussion, yeah. mm -hmm. and and labels that labels and feelings towards the other mm -hmm. that and and I use that word the other very specifically, right? Because we use that a lot. We use that in a different way. We use that as we're trying to speak for the other, that we use privilege, that we try to use our privileged positions to speak out for people who have been othered. But then we shouldn't, in our own rhetoric and in our own work, do a deliberate work of othering. Othering people we disagree with. Othering people that I think fundamentally misconstrue the theology that I preach and the God that I love. However, it, I can't... I can't in good moral conscience, and I have been guilty of this time and time again. I am an angry, fighting person. I am a fighter. I realize it's a really bad quote from the movie Eight Mile, but I am a <laughs> fighter. And what I like to do is fight. And when I get really mad, I throw the rule book out the window and can string together really offensive things faster than you would believe possible. But my journey over the past 10 years of my life in trying to become a pastor is to understand now, when I'm sitting across the campfire from a Kenyan guy that is telling me that all homosexuals are going to hell, I cannot hate him. And I cannot push him to the margins. And as much as I don't like Dr. Eddie Fox, I have to listen to what he has to say out of the sheer hope to God that he will someday <laughs> listen to what I have to say. And if I don't do that, if I don't listen to him, then I can never expect him to listen to me. I think I agree with you, and I, I also think, as far, I, I was just thinking about the responsible leader question. Um, I think what we can do as responsible leaders is be pretty honest about how we feel and why, but be careful to talk about our own experience and not necessarily say, and everybody else should think this way too. Right. I've seen very rich relationships, I mean, I'm just thinking about my own congregation, that I deeply care about people I don't agree with at all theologically and that there's something really powerful in that kind of relationship um, and so maybe I think I think what has the tendency is as a as a leader to want to make everybody happy and maybe walk the line mm -hmm. very carefully and maybe the maybe an answer is to 
not walk that line quite so carefully to try to make everybody happy, but also stay in relationship with people and and keep those conversations open and say, this is how I feel. What do you think? 